Welcome to the Brave Bold Brilliant podcast. I am your host, Jeanette Linford, and I am here today with a very good friend of mine. I would say one of my best friends, actually. Um, but more than that, Joe Balfour is the managing director of the Cambridge Rare Disease Network. So we're going to be talking all about how Joe got into running a charity, how important it is to, you know, actually be doing good in the world, in particular for children that have got rare diseases, and everything else in between as we have a conversation. <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome Jo. Thank you, it's lovely to be here in this gorgeous part of Wales. <laughs> and we're recording this at, at my home actually, at Chris and I's home, so it's um, a double whammy because we've had some nice time together we're and right. we're doing the podcast as well, so how cool is that? Really lovely. Bang yeah. for our book, that's what we're all about. So Jo, let's start with your journey, where I started. I know your journey, but people listening won't know your journey because it's a really interesting evolution, I think, how you started out and where you've ended up as MD of the uh, Cambridge Rare Disease Network. It is. It is an interesting journey, and I mean, I could I could talk for weeks about it, to be perfectly honest. But um, but to capture it in a few minutes, I would say, you know, my, my journey sort of career wise started um, with a passion actually. So my passion at school was always geography. I loved being out and about. I loved geography field trips. I loved nature. Um, just seeing how the kind of the natural world interacted with the the human world. And, um, and hence I went to do a geography degree at Manchester University and twiddling my thumbs at the end of that thinking what do I do now in terms of a career and I'm, I'm afraid I went for the really obvious <laughs> the really obvious route which was I'll be a geography teacher and um, I came from a family <laughs> of a uh, <laughs> historical line of female terrifying teachers and I <laughs> All these feisty, feisty, opinionated women, and I always said, I'm never going to be one of them. I'm, <laughs> I'm never going to be a teacher. And that's what I did. So um, I followed the party line and went off to, I had my first teaching job in Liverpool at an all boys comprehensive school, terrifying. Um, and then moved to London and continued teaching there. And it, it just was a really natural evolution for me. So. I started teaching geography, but within, I'd say, three years of my career, I was finding that um, because of the nature of the the school that I was working in, you know, city, inner city London, um, a lot of the young people that I was working with faced lots of really complex challenges on top Mm. of just getting to school every day and and being educated. And um, I became really interested in the whole area of special educational needs so it's so working with young people to kind of to, to really help them get the best from their education um, when they were facing challenges so I was in and out of the special needs department every day saying you know I've got, I've got a class tomorrow uh, there's three kids in there that are dyslexic I want to be able to do a better lesson for them mm. what could I change what could I adapt and they would support me to do a better lesson and um and within a year of me being in and out of their team all of the time and learning from them, um, the, the special needs coordinator, the person in charge of that department, was retiring. And I, I guess it just, it made me think, well, why not me? Why, why don't I go for that job? Mm. And I look back now and think, I can't believe I was that brave. <laughs> <laughs> I was like three years into my teaching career. Um, but I, I applied and I got the job. So that was that was me really. That was me moving into a whole new area. Mm. So I was the head of special needs in London for a while, um, and then eventually moved to Cambridge. And um, I can I continued in that role for a, for a while there. And again, I I was just tempted into a slightly different position by a really lovely teacher that used to come to our school every week, and she used to support kids. Uh, who were in foster care or children's homes. <clears throat> so it was still within my arena, but quite quite a specific role. Mm. And um, and I loved listening to her and learning from her, you know, learning about the psychology of, of young people in care and the trauma that they've been through. And um, and again, it was it was her coming to me maybe five years down the line and saying, we, we've got a position in our team coming up might you be interested? Mm. And I think I was just ready. I was I was at the cusp of sort of wanting to do something different. Um, maybe wanting to do something that didn't restrict me to one school. 
I wanted to get out there and, and meet more people and yeah and um, I, I applied for that role and that's where I ended up so I worked for that team for 15 years um, working with young people in care all over the country so Cambridge of children uh, but placed in Kent placed in you know the, the west of, of England up in the north and I would travel to their schools and make sure that that everything was going well for them um, so we're talking kind of fast forward 25 years now, 25 years in education. And um, I'm in Cambridge and a really good friend of mine has just finished his PhD. And he's exploring, you know, what's next for him in terms of his career. And he came up with a really brilliant concept, which was to, to repurpose drugs for rare diseases. So he'd been working a little bit with, with others researching rare diseases. And what he discovered was, you know, the pathway to developing a treatment is really long. It's 15 years on average. And there are thousands of rare diseases out there, 8,000 approximately. And um, only five of these, 5% of these have got a a treatment. Mm, So you kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're faced with this like insurmountable challenge of how on earth do you get treatments to 8,000 different rare diseases when each one takes 15 years to get a drug. Um, so he, he had met somebody, um, a chap called David Brown in Cambridge, who had actually repurposed Viagra. So um, it was an accidental find almost that Viagra could have an additional purpose, which we all know now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of you might have tried it. <laughs> Listeners, I, if you haven't, maybe. I'm not making any judgments there. <laughs> um, but, you know, that opened up this whole new world of, like, yeah. you know, taking a dog that's already in existence, has already been checked and is safe, people are using it, um, repurposing it for a different, for a different disease. Um, so whilst he was gathering all of his um, his people together, thinking about how he was going to set up this startup company, how he was going to get investment from that, um, he was meeting scientists, researchers, entrepreneurs, um, people embedded in Cambridge University, and was bowled over but by the amount of work that was going on in the rare disease sector. But they were all working in their tiny little you know, isolated pockets in Mm. silos and not coming together. So not being one to shirk from a challenge, (laughs) he was was (laughs) looking for um, seed funding for his company called Helix now. And at the same time, talking to me about the need for a charity, Um, something that was, you know, going to start at the same time. This was something that needed to, to happen consecutively. Mm. A charity that was going to bring all of these people together to be able to really kickstart what can Cambridge offer to rare diseases. Um, and, and hence the charity began. And, you know, where do I come into that? Well, I was a bit of a sounding board originally. But um, how I actually got involved was because he said, we need a conference we need a conference right in the heart of Cambridge at the Judge Business School and we need to bring all of these important people together and I don't have anyone else, <laughs> don't have anyone to organise that and I think you'd be great at it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it really was as simple as that. I said, I have no experience of conferences, I've never organised an event, um, but I'll give it a go. So that very first year, back in 2016, I think it was, 15, I organised the first conference with, with a team of volunteers. And and I've been with the charity ever since. Amazing. So that's really how we got from A to B. Wow. There's loads in here because, <clears throat> because I think, you know, a few things just to pick on as you were talking. The, the point around, you know, when you went for the promotion, when you pushed yourself into these different scenarios where... Maybe you weren't quite ready, but you just thought, actually, I'll give it a go. I'll just, I'll just, you know, why not? Why not me? And I think, you know, the, the, the bravery that shows is, is, is important for anyone listening. You know, yeah. if you want to do something, if you even got a slight interest in something, just, just put yourself out there and give it a go because you never know where it might lead. And that, I mean, your journey is fascinating because you've gone from geography <laughs> 
to charity and you go, well, actually, when you describe the path, it's perfectly logical, actually, isn't it? How mm. it's evolved. But you would go, oh, there to there seems like, you know, a random leap, but it's not. It's been an evolution. And I think the other thing is around finding your passion, because when you talk about helping kids and, and we lived together for years, right? So, I mean, I, I was always bowled over by what you did and the impact you have for young people for, for all these years. But I think what shines through for you is your passion. Mm. Um, so how important has that been when you're running the charity with all the pressures and everything that comes with it? Because it isn't easy. I know it's not easy. Um, how important has it been to have that true purpose and knowing what you were here to do in the world, if you like? Um, I mean, it's a really good question. And I think, I, th I think I'm just that kind of person. I mean, one, you know, you go back to taking taking what I would call risks really mm. so looking at your career path and thinking you know if, if I look back now I can't believe I was that brave person who <laughs> who thought I was ready for those jobs because I really wasn't but I think what I feel really strongly about is that if you have a passion the passion will drive your desire to learn yeah um so you know I I would argue that my degree and my PGC, which is my teacher training, neither of those things set me up for work. What set me up for work was an ability to connect with people. You know that, that thing that I said about every day I would go down to the special needs department and say, I've got these, mm. these kids tomorrow and I want to do the best by them. Um, who can make some suggestions, recommendations for how I work? Mm. I mean, some of those some of those teachers in that special needs team used to come and team teach with me. So they would say to me, "Let's plan a lesson together. You plan it for the main group. I'll plan it for the kids who need some adaptations. Yeah, and then you teach the kids who need the adaptations, and I'll teach your main group. And let's and by doing that, by being very open to working with people that had the skills I didn't have, to learn from them, to um, to never ever say, you know, I know everything and I know no best, but to very much be kind of bringing in other people's skills and knowledge and expertise so that they could build my team. Mm. You know, I think, I think there's a lot to be said for that, a lot to, to be said for not feeling like you have to be qualified or ready for everything. Yeah. Just take the risk. You learn on the job. Yeah. You learn on the job and you kind of, you almost you create a role for yourself. Mm. Um, you know, when I first took on this, like I've, I've only been in this manage, managing director role for maybe two years now. And um, when I took it on, they said to me, what do you want the job title to be? <laughs> do you remember we had Yes, I do remember very well. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to be CEO because mm -hmm. I don't feel like that's what I am yet. Yeah. Um, and I, I chose to be operations director at that point. And, and I would have still been there. I would have been happy to just sit with that because it didn't matter to me. But everybody, everybody around me, including you, yeah, going, no. are you going to get the new job title? When are you going to tell yeah. them that you're managing director? Yeah. Or, or CEO or whatever it might be. Um, so for me, it is, it is about taking a risk. It's about believing in your ability to to learn on the job, to, to build skills as you go. It's about being being open and um, and welcoming of other people's skills and experience mm. and um, and helping them to bolster yours. Um, and I, I feel really strongly that if you've got a passion that drives you, then everything else will fall into place at some point. Yeah, 100%. You know, 100%. I, I know that we've both talked about imposter sy syndrome before and it's definitely mm. something I've experienced. I've... You know, I, feel, I meet a lot of people in the world disease, um, the rare disease space who have got a lived experience. You know, yeah. they personally have been affected. Mm. They either have a rare disease themselves or they have a child who does. Mm. And when you're alongside people like that, their passion is, is incredible. Um, you know, they have a real driver mm. to do the work that they do. And sometimes you're with them thinking, oh, I'm not in that position. Yeah. And I feel like I'm imposing here. Yeah. But um, but I think you need to get over that. 
Yeah, definitely. And also, you know, you bring a different a different capability and neutrality. You bring a, a perspective that they wouldn't have. You know, they might be coming more from the practicalities of having a child with those needs or themselves with those needs. And, and what does that mean every day for them? Whereas for you as as the as a managing director, you're you're looking at it from a different perspective, aren't you? And and, and that brings added value to them. You yeah. know, you don't and I think that's it, isn't it? Celebrate our differences, you know, and, and embrace those differences. Um, so no, that's absolutely spot on. And I mean, I, I see our organisation as an o- umbrella organisation to be, to support those people. Yeah. You know, so they they should be where they are. They are the right people for those jobs mm. um, to lead a specific rare disease charity because they're, they're the people that are driving, you know, the they, they're trying to recruit people to research for them. They're trying to recruit medical professionals that can support their cause mm. and later down the line um, to to bring on drug development companies mm. you know, to help them. Um, what, what we do is provide all of them with the platform to meet, to connect. Uh, we nurture those relationships. Yeah. So I, I, I don't need to be the person that's personally con- connected. Not at all. Not at I'm all. the person that can stand back, see the bigger picture yeah. and connect them together. Yeah, but, but through all of that, caring and wanting to, to do the best you can for as many people as possible and as many families. Absolutely. So so let's talk a little bit about the about the charity, kind of where it started and where it is now, because it's it has changed quite a lot over over the yes. years, hasn't it? It's massive. Yeah. So it's interesting. I, I remember doing a couple of courses about startups and um, one of the key key take homes that I had was that, you know, you'll you'll begin with a very definite idea. Mm. <clears throat> but you mustn't get too fixated on that idea because it's actually really fine to say my aims and objectives and vision and mission are this now, mm. but in five, ten years' time, they'll have evolved and changed. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> and that's very much what's happened. So I, I described how, you know, my friend was starting up this company and his original vision for the Cambridge Rare Disease Network was to build a network of professionals um, in the Cambridge area and then to share that expertise with the world. Yeah. So it's very much about the Cambridge brand, actually. Mm. You know, what do we identify with the Cambridge brand? It's about education. It's about academia. It's about brilliance. It's about Nobel Prize winners. Mm. Um, it's about science, innovation. And, and that's exactly what's needed, actually, to mm. be the backbone of rare disease progress. But is it enough? And what I did very quickly as being part of the organisation early on, was recognise the gap. So what was missing in our in our vision was the people affected. Yeah. So I, I very quickly decided that um, we needed to be working locally in Cambridge with families who had children or themselves were living yeah. with a rare disease. Because if you don't know what, what they want and you're not immersed in their day-to-day lives... You were just making assumptions about what's right for them. Mm. So, you know, I, I often say to people, um, you know, how do you know that they want a drug, that they want a cure? Um, have you asked them? Yeah. And actually, you know, we, we've got people in our um, trustee board who have lived experience. So we have one doctor who's actually a young um, medical doctor and she has a rare condition herself. She mm. has albinism um, and that results in her being visually imp- impaired. Um, and she will often say, you know, I don't, I don't want a treatment or a cure. I'm completely reconciled with who I am and my, my disability, if you want to call it that. Mm. <clears throat> um, what I want is acceptance. I want empathy. I want um, equipment, technology. I want um, people to build a, a, a world which is accessible to me. Mm. And, and then I'm fine. <laughs> you know, I'm not looking for that magic bullet yeah so it's really important for us to have over the last five years to have welcomed in the patient voice yeah so we do that by having um a local community group of families and kids affected and i mean really early on they said like we we don't want to be called the cambridge rare disease network it's too long it's a bit boring um it's not us so they've called themselves unique feet (laughs) <laughs> so Unique Feet um, actually started as a, as a group of four families. You know, you wouldn't believe it. There must be 
thousands of families in Cambridgeshire that have a rare condition. And we, we reached out to schools, to social care teams, to friends, and we, four, we found four families back in 2016. Wow. And they were actually our, our group for over a year, just those four families. Mm. But they built this incredible bond and, um, and have really kind of bolstered, bolstered each other's confidence. Mm. And that little group has now grown and we've got more and more families joining all the time. Um, and by doing that, we've kind of, we built a very different charity. So we now have Cambridge, our city, our home, mm. where children and families live and we support them. Um, and then on a, on a broader scale, we have our events program. We run conferences, we run a festival, lots of little things in between. And that's our patient groups, mm. that's our, our scientists, our experts, all coming together in one space. Yeah. But very much with the patient voice at the heart of it. Mm. Um, and then we have our companies forum. And our companies forum are international drug development companies who we bring together into a neutral space to talk about the challenges and to think think of solutions, basically. Mm. So we, we kind of, you know, we started with our very Cambridge-centric model. Yeah of industries and professionals then we've brought into the hub our families and our community mm. and now we've kind of expanded it back out again yeah into patient groups nationally internationally and companies and experts nationally yeah because i mean you've got so many different stakeholders uh, all with different requirements and different yeah. motivations and, and of course your your role really is to be able to service all of those stakeholders separately but with the common thread throughout exactly. that actually brings it together and, and you do that exceptionally well but it's funny because yesterday mm-hmm. we were chatting about uh, when we we're out on a lovely walk down Rosilly on the beach we were talking about the brand weren't we essentially and and the name yeah. of cambridge and and how you've articulated it there is to say you know Yes, okay. This is a lo- this is a local charity, but it's it's not. It's global as well. It's got the yes. potential to reach you know people all over the world for good and do good. And I guess that's really you know you, where you are now is you're, you're sort of thinking much bigger, aren't you, than than where you started probably. We definitely are. You know? And um, you know the, these these challenges of rare diseases can't be addressed on a local scale. Mm. So what we can do is with our families, we can say okay. I mean, all of our kids have got different rare conditions and they all present with completely different symptoms, completely different levels of, you know, physical, sensory, neurological disability. Mm. Um, Some, you know, you you absolutely wouldn't have a clue that they had anything wrong with them. Um, Metabolic disorders, disorders of the immune system. So it's so varied. And you kind of think, how on earth... Can you work with such a, a, a widely sort of different group of people and find a common thread? But there absolutely are common threads. Mm. So what we've done is we've taken those common threads. So, you know, what's challenging for all of you? It's challenging to get a diagnosis. Mm. The average time to diagnosis is around about five years. Wow. You know, why why is that difficult? Why why can nobody spot them? Well, because there's 8,000 different rare diseases. So mm. this is a GP, is your kind of, you know, your primary healthcare um, provider. You're rarely going to come across these things. Yeah. So difficult to get a diagnosis, that's common throughout. Um, a lack of information. Mm. So you get your diagnosis, if you're lucky. Um, and then you, you, you go to Dr. Google. <laughs> so everybody does. Yeah. Even the doctors will do that. Yeah. They will say, I'm so sorry, but this is not a disease I've come across before. Let's Google it. Yeah. Um, or let's look to other sort of medical literature. But, you know, what you're finding there is this awful, disparate mess of information that's, you know, some of it's really high, high level academic papers that you yeah. have to literally translate. Mm. Um, and the rest of it's a bit hit and miss and you're not quite sure whether it's whether it's actually good information. Mm. So, you know, you struggle to actually then get some information. So as a parent, you're thinking, I don't know what the trajectory of this disease is. Mm. You know, I don't know what the, what's the long term for my kid here? I've got no idea what this looks like. Yeah. Um, and then you find out there's no treatments. So you've, you've got this dreadful shock of finding out you have something. Mm. You start to find out information. It sounds a bit scary further down the line. And there's no, there's no treatment or cure for that. How do you deal with that? How do you get your, your head around the fact that there's nothing to help? Mm. So that's a common thread. And then eventually um, what we call care coordination is really poor. 
So, you know, often if you're diagnosed with a disease, something, you know, more common such as cancer, there's a very definite um, what we call care pathway. Yeah. You, you know what the steps are. Um, you know what the treat- treatment options are. For rare diseases, that's, that's actually quite rare. There are some diseases that have been very well researched, like um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy or Huntington's disease. Um, the the disease that Stephen Hawking is fam- famous for, ALS. Um, you know, there's a core group of diseases that have, for one reason or another, developed a lot of fundraising, so they've got a lot of research behind them. Yeah. And for them, you know, it's slightly easier. There is a care pathway. There's still more mm. treatment. Yeah. Um, but for most, it's 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 a mystery. So we take those common challenges, and and that's what we work on. Mm. Um, and that's how we we kind of unite everyone. So we've got our small group. We've identified their common challenges. It's the same across all the patient groups that we work with. Yeah. So collectively, we need to bring the international community together to address those core challenges. Mm, yeah, no, I, I mean, it is, it, 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 when you describe it like that, you can see how do you take this disparate 8,000 separate diseases and actually address it as a collective. That's yeah. a challenge, isn't it? And, but, but still have the differences where, where you need them, the so, so similarities yeah. and differences. And, you know, I mean, because someone listening to this, they might be, might be thinking, oh, I'm not quite sure, you know, my, I, I've got a suspicion that my, my child or something's going on and I don't quite know where to start. You know, they might be very early in the, in, the, in the stages. What advice would you give to someone that's got a child that was suspected of having a rare disease or a yeah. rare condition? And what kind of advice would you give them? And this isn't, they don't have to be based in Cambridge, it could be anywhere in the world, it right? Could be anywhere but in certainly the world. anywhere in the UK for, for, as a starting point. So, what, what would be the, the advice you would give to them as to, to how to sort of go about moving things forward and taking stuff forward? I mean, we, we actually, um, with our group, we actually work with kids that are undiagnosed as well because there's a general level of acceptance that if you're undiagnosed, if you have a, a mystery condition, so you've got a set of symptoms and you know you're not meeting your normal developmental milestones mm. you know so you're not beginning to whatever it might be talk at the right time or walk at the right time um, you're not meeting the right height or, or weight um, milestones you know all those things are triggers for parents mm. um, and they're the kind of things that they will go to a GP with and say I'm not quite sure that if there's something wrong here yeah I've just got a gut feeling you know they're not quite at the same level of their siblings or their or their peers, you know, yeah. can we check this out? Yeah. Um, and it often starts that way, that you're just not quite reaching the normal mm. milestones at the right time. Mm. And um, and often at that point, you know, you might go and see your primary care mm. health worker and, you know, you'll start to maybe have assessments or tests and very often they'll come back and say, there's nothing, there's nothing coming up. Yeah. There's nothing obvious here. And then... And then it's left for a little while, but then you continue to spot new milestones not being reached and new problems emerging. And um, as a parent, I think I think it's, you know, some really simple things that I've learned from other parents are to keep a record, keep a really clear record of what's happening. Yeah. Almost like a diary. Yeah. You know, not not to an obsessive amount, but just. You know, when when are you spotting things that don't seem right to you? Write it down. What did that look like? Mm. Was there a trigger for that? Um, was it the first time? How many times a week does it happen? Yeah. And and you begin to build a picture. And what I'm actually seeing, because we're, we're big fans of technology at mm. the Cambridge Rare Disease Network, and I'm definitely starting to see some really helpful apps and tracking tools which a family could use to keep that record. Yeah. And... Um, you know, and some of them are free. Mm. So this is not sort of like big expense for anyone, but just no. keeping a nice record because data is important in rare diseases. Mm. Um, collecting, you know, collecting that together. That would be my first bit of big advice. Yeah. And then if you go to a GP and you're not getting the response or the, the empathy or the understanding that you feel you should, mm. and it, it does happen. Yeah. You feel like you're not being believed or you're, yeah. you know, people think you're a bit of a hypochondriac mm, or, or mm. whatever. Um, get a second opinion. Yeah. 
Don't be afraid to ask two people, to ask three people, because sometimes it's about finding the right person. Absolutely, yeah. It is about nailing that, that, you know, I've got a health professional that I feel that I can trust who believes me. Mm. And that's that's someone that's going to support me on what could be quite a long journey. Mm. Um, it's about now recognising that um, there are some quite phenomenal changes in the healthcare system that could support rare diseases in the future. So, um, I, David Cameron, remember mm. David Cameron? Oh yes, yep. Yeah. He had a son called Ivan, and his son had a rare disease. And very sadly, tragically, he died. Um, but David Cameron used that experience to really get behind something called the 100,000 Genomes Project. Now, this, was, um, this is Britain, UK life sciences at its best, mm. where Genomics England, in collaboration with other partners, developed um, whole genome sequencing. You'll have heard it a lot in, in relation to COVID, yeah. where you take a human's genome yeah. and you sequence it and you, f you look in those billions of letters um, for the glitches. Might be just something tiny, mm. but that one tiny difference in your DNA code can be the trigger to a rare disease. Right. 80% um, of rare diseases are genetic, so this, this component is important. Mm. Um, after the 100,000 Genomes Project, where they basically took the genome of 100,000 people with rare diseases and, and cancers, mm. and they sequenced them, and they collected tons of data, but also got lots of diagnosis. Um, after that, they then have now launched something called, um, it's a new kind of whole genome sequencing offering within the NHS. So it, I think there are eight hubs, seven or eight hubs across the UK. Cambridge is one of them. Mm. Um, it's called Genomics East. And basically, they are the team that are now going to sequence the genome of children and adults where it's a mystery. There is no diagnosis. And they can't use, they can't pin down an answer with the normal testing. So this is quite, like, this has started in the last two years. Wow. It was stalled because of COVID. It's now up and running. Um, this is going to change diagnoses and, and journeys for lots of, lots of people. Mm. Um, so I would say to, to somebody out there struggling to get that diagnosis, struggling with the, you know, the answer, to request that. You know, once mm. once all the standard tests have been done and you're still sat there twiddling thumbs and, and yeah. it's a mystery, can my child be referred for whole genome sequencing? Okay. Um, and then find your tribe. <laughs> I would definitely say you've got to find your group. You've got to find other like-minded people like you who are going through the same situation. And uh, there's a really nice... So uh, there's another umbrella organisation called SWAN. SWAN is part of Genetic Alliance UK and SWAN stands for Syndromes Without a Name. And it's for children who don't have a diagnosis. Right. Join a group like that. You know, get, get involved in their Facebook group. Uh, find a community because they are going to be, you know, your people to bounce ideas off, your people to find some solace in sometimes, mm, mm. to share inspiration and insights with to just feel like you've got somebody and you're not alone. Yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, you know, I mean, there's loads of information that you've got, isn't there, to hand on yeah. your website. You know, people can engage with, with, you know, the Cambridge Rare Disease Network as well. Absolutely. Um, even if they don't live in Cambridge, presumably you would welcome those conversations. And there are groups like this all over the world. Yeah. So, you know, we connect regularly with a, a, a huge group called Eurydice, and Eurydice is obviously European-based. Mm. So that brings together, you know, we're members of Eurydice, alongside hundreds of other rare disease charities across Europe. Yeah. Um, you know, there's rare disease India, there's rare disease um, South Africa, there's tons of organisations in America, both disease-specific and, you know, more umbrella groups like Global Genes and Nord. You just have to do a bit of Googling. Yeah, And yeah. you'll find something in your region yeah okay brilliant so 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 actually people don't need to feel alone there is there is there's a network there and, and i think those are some really brilliant practical pieces of advice that you've just given joe so that's that's amazing just just a little bit to you touched on some of the the rare diseases 
earlier you were yeah. mentioning what they were can you just run through the top five again just mm-hmm. so that people will kind of get more of a sense of maybe the breadth of this but even yeah. those top five and then um and then we're going to talk a little bit around i think not just rare diseases but also if you have a child that is struggling with any condition actually there's some general stuff and advice that you would give as well isn't there so yeah, so yeah. Maybe, maybe let's talk about the, the top five and um, just in a little bit more detail so people get a sense so i i often think that the language that we use in rare diseases i.e that word rare is our biggest enemy because mm. by saying something's rare you're saying you know, it's unique, it's different, I don't need to worry about it because it's it's somebody else's problem, it's a yeah. tiny problem, and actually that couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think just understanding the concept of what does rare disease actually mean yes. is important as a starting point. So, you know, I mentioned that there's 8,000 different rare diseases, there are, uh, maybe more, mm. <laughs> we just haven't discovered them yet, there's yeah. more being discovered every week. Wow. Um, but I think what's important is that, that definition. So in the UK, the definition of a rare disease is that it affects less than one in 2,000 people. Now that varies slightly around the world, but it's around about that number. Mm. So in, in America, it's five people in 10,000. Um, but you know, it's about the same. So one people in 2,000 are affected or less. Um, it's a disease which... Um, as I mentioned also, 80% of them are genetic in origin, so they are inherited in some way. Uh, but there are tons of other ways that you can develop a rare disease. Um, some come through, you know, some, some are there at birth, mm. some are developed or emerge through childhood, but there are tons of them also that emerge in adulthood. Mm. And we forget that sometimes, that there's adults affected here too. Yeah. Um, the 20% that aren't genetic um, can be environmental triggers, they can be bacterial, um, they can be, you know, m- what we call multifactorial, so they're not just one gene affected. Yeah. So there's tons of, and mitochondrial, that's another one uh, that comes up quite often. So there's tons of reasons why you can get, a, you know, develop a rare disease. Um, but the five most common that I think people have heard of are Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, cystic fibrosis, ALS, which be, as I mentioned, became famous because of not just Stephen Hawking, but mm. also the ice bucket challenge. Oh yeah, that was yeah. all about ALS. Yeah. Um, sickle cell anemia is another one that people will have heard of, and Huntington's disease. So I'd say I'd say they are the kind of most commonly known. No. Yeah. And the reason that the others are not known is because they probably have smaller numbers of people affected. Yeah. So there are ultra rare diseases where, you know, there were three children in our group and they are the only person in the world with that diagnosis. Wow. It doesn't mean there isn't anybody else out there, mm. but there's nobody with that medical record yet. Yeah. Um, and that, that must be, I mean, that is daunting, isn't it? Absolutely, gosh. To be the only yeah. person in the world with a particular diagnosis. But rare diseases generally have quite um, complex names. So they're often named after the doctor who discovered them or they are a collection of numbers and letters. Mm. So they're not they're not particularly kind of friendly names yeah. that are easy for people to remember, yeah. to be perfectly honest. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think sort of getting, getting to grips with what actually is a rare disease, mm. what do we mean by that? Yeah. Um, so it's about incidence being, being low and and I, I would I would also like to throw in another statistic because I'm not a big fan of lots of stats but actually 1 in 17 people will be affected by a rare condition at some point in their life no. so some of them are life, lifelong some of them are intermittent you know they, they come and go mm. and it's interesting when I got involved in this charity I was thinking you know I feel like a bit of a fraud here because I don't know anyone with a rare disease and I haven't got one Yeah. and I've now discovered that is absolutely not true so I look at my own family and I have a nephew who had, was diagnosed with cancer when he was 14. Mm. Um, it was called nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And actually that is an ultra rare disease. A lot of childhood cancers are rare diseases. Mm. Um, I just didn't know it at the time and nobody called it that. Yeah. It wasn't the language used. Um, my dad had two different rare diseases. One was um, called femigoid and, and he 
he developed in his 80s huge blisters all over his body. Um, there was a treatment for that, fortunately, and it we managed to, to solve that problem, but it came and came and went. Yeah. Um, I also have a, a brother who is at the moment going through um, a diagnosis odyssey, a diagnostic odyssey where they're not sure what it is he has, um, but it potentially could be genetic. It could be a rare disease. Mm. And I am constantly now, now that I'm aware, yeah. I am constantly bumping into people who are saying, oh, I've got a condition called such and such. And you're like, oh, it's yeah. a rare disease. And they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know. Gosh. And um, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. We just don't know when this is why awareness raising is so vital mm, mm. because actually we could all be affected yeah absolutely absolutely so so in terms of some of the the families and the children living with rare diseases and of course how it manifests and what it is for them on a daily basis will be incredibly different i'm sure yeah. but the, we were talking we were we were coming for the loo actually yesterday <laughs> <laughs> and we were we got chatting didn't we around you know families that you know how do they how do they navigate through everyday life with the challenges that their child might have so you know can you just pick up a a couple of a couple of examples of what it's like to live with a rare disease what are some of the day-to-day challenges that these kids and parents have so i mean it is vastly different from one family to another but there are again some common threads and i think one, one of the really the one that stands out for me as being such a challenge is that often a parent will have to give up a career to become a full-time carer mm. you know and ha- who plans for that mm. you know when you're 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 building your career and you're thinking about your future you have all these kind of visions of what that's going to be like um i don't think anybody ever has a vision that they're going to end up having to give it up and um and be their child's full-time carer mm. you know and that, i think that's that's a really that's that's my you know that's mind blowing for me. That's life changing, mm. and um, and I really respect the people who have to make that life choice. Mm. They'd argue it's not a choice actually, and I think about those people, and I think about you know what what do they need? Because this is this is something that could affect any parent or even actually us as adults. We mm. may have to become full time carers because we have a you know, a, an elderly parent who mm. needs us at that point in time. And I, I know people who've given up their careers to look after their elderly parents yeah. rather than put them in a care home. Yeah. So this is not unique to rare diseases. It's not unique to, to disabilities. This is, you know, this is something we could all face in our lives. And I think, I think my message really for people who are potentially faced with that is to, again, find a community you are not alone in this. Mm. There are lots of people out there in the same boat as you. And I think having that friendship group, that community around you that you can share experience with, offload to, mm. um, pick their brains, you know, share ideas uh, and actually start to influence um, whether it's local or national policy mm. to make lives better. For others like you so again i go back to my little group you know when when we started we said let's let's have a whatsapp group for the moms it's always the moms <laughs> at the moment i need to do something about the dads uh, we need to get a community sort of properly up and running for them it's my yeah. next challenge but with the moms you know they they gravitated to this whatsapp group and you know at first it's a friendship group and they're they're chatting and sharing information um But, you know, I look back now, because I moderate that group, I look back through five years worth of messages. Oh, my God, it is a wealth, a wealth of information. Mm. They are absolute genius. You know, that what's in there is gold dust. And I'm thinking at the moment about how we can capture that, actually. Mm. So I would I would say to anyone, find your group. It is it is going to be the support network that you need it's going to be the um it's going to be the google alternative you know you're going to search that group yeah. for your answers um they are going to be the people that make you feel brave bold and brilliant actually yeah. they're going to be the people that that bolster you up that give you the strength that you need um when you're feeling low um but what we've discovered from our group is that 
building that confidence as a group, as a collective voice, mm. has has a whole plethora of other um, opportunities open up. Mm. So our, our mums group is now the voice of rare diseases in our, in our region, without a shadow of a doubt. Mm. So they are, you know... <laughs> They're media whores at the moment. So they're, they're, you know, they're in the newspapers, they're in um, pharmaceutical journals telling their story, they're on the TVs telling their story, they are, um, you know, they're supporting CRDN, they're working for mm. CRDN as our social media people, our newsletter writers, and, um, and they're embedding themselves really firmly into, you know, new policy that's developing and emerging. Mm. So... Um, we're really excited that there is a Cambridge rare disease, not a rare disease. <laughs> I said the wrong thing there. There was a Cambridge Children's Hospital being built. Yeah. And we are making sure that all the rare disease families are part of the um, patient sort of focus groups mm. that are helping develop this hospital. Amazing. So we're making sure that their voices are in there from the very start so that whatever hospital is created works for them. Yeah. And we were talking yesterday, weren't we, as well, about, you know, the practicalities of, you know, toilet facilities. Yeah. Um, and that's that's another initiative, isn't it, that's actually it really gathered momentum. Just talk about that, because I think that's quite interesting. It's probably something day-to-day that affects not only, ch- you know, children with rare diseases, but also children with other, and, you know, and adults, and, and too, adults as well. So, yeah, talk about that, because I think so that's this, important. This is, um, this is something called the Changing Places um campaign and you know if you're not immersed in the world of of rare diseases or knowing people with disabilities you might not know that you know some of them still um into adulthood will need um very particular um toileting facilities and they need space for a start they might have a wheelchair and they need Mm. space to maneuver that they might need to um take a, a carer in with them to support um, they may, may need, need a table to change that. Yep. And there are, these kinds of facilities are absolutely few and far between. Mm. Now, imagine if if that's a necessity in your day-to-day life. Yeah. How, how do you manage that if the facilities aren't there? You know, how do you, you know, go on holiday? How do you travel? How do you go shopping yeah. if you can't find an accessible loo? So um, a, a bunch of, of people came together who need these type, type of facilities. So this is mums of children, but also adults. Yep. And they started this Changing Places campaign. And it, the, the, the power of that collective voice, social media, um, you know, really um, targeting their MPs, um, you know, fighting for policy change has been monumental. I mean, mm. they've done an absolutely incredible job. And there is now something called a changing places toilet. And um, there's also mobile changing places loose. Oh, amazing. So, for example, a couple of years ago, post pre-COVID, I went to the Cambridge Folk Festival and they had one on site, a changing oh, places toilet yeah. for adults. And it's just, it's like a little kind of, you know, prefab. Mm. And it's all very private and, you know, means anybody can attend. Yeah. So this campaign's been running for a while now, and I just had really good news from one of our mums who's involved in it recently to say that the government has now recognised this need. They've allocated a big pot of funding, and now councils can apply for this pot of funding to be able to install more Changing Places loos in the right places in their region. So we're hoping that people like, you know, likewise, like the National Trust and other big organisations like that are going to follow suit. Amazing. I mean, it just shows, doesn't it, how what starts with, you know, one individual or a small group of people, the the impact and the change that you can have um, that has a really wide reach. So, no, I love that. That's that's amazing. So let's just, I'm conscious of time because we could chat for hours and we can can both talk. We we have been friends for nearly 30 years, Joe. So, you know, there's a lot to talk about. but, But specifically, on 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 the charity yeah. what are the what are the kind of ways that people can support you because i think what you've done really well in in this conversation is to articulate you know what you do locally but also the global impact and you know and i'm sure that people listening will want to get involved 
themselves either because they have a child or themselves, you know, some challenges in this area or because they're a good person that wants to be able to support and, and give back themselves. So what are, what are the ways that people can get involved and, and support you guys? So if you, if you are out there and you are a family affected by wear conditions, um, you know, what's really important, I think, is for you to, you to you know, get involved either with your local community group or with an umbrella organisation like ours. Because we need your voices. We need mm-hmm. your voices and we want to support you. So I think that's really crucial. You know, get on our website, find out about our Unique Feet community group. Um, if you're not in our region, find out, ask us, is there anything else like this elsewhere? And we can signpost you. Yeah. So I think it's about getting involved first. Um, you know, we, we organise lots of public facing events. So we do conferences for our stakeholders. Uh, we run our companies forum for our companies and patient groups. But we also run something called Rare Fest. And Rare Fest is the, the world's only, the first ever rare disease inspired festival. And you might think, oh my God, what is that going to be about? <laughs> what are we actually going to do? Um, but it's really cool. It's all about science, technology, about advocacy, uh, that beautiful kind of overlap between science and the arts, you know, where you can, yeah. there's a lot emerging in that field at the moment. So it's all hands on, it's fun, it's, um, it's, it's a science, technology, arts festival, you know, so come along to that. That's in November. Uh, and you run it every year, don't you? That. We, do it, we do it biannually, actually. Biannually, yeah, right. It's a biannual festival. Maybe maybe we'll get to a stage where we can do it annually. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, that's a really, like, it's a lovely sort of, you know, it's there for the experts, for the curious, for anybody of any age. Um, what's also exciting about that festival is that you, you get to meet the people. So you get to meet the scientists and the researchers and the drug companies. Um, you get to meet you know, artists and, and people living with a rare disease. And I think especially for that kind of young young age group growing up, kind of thinking about how do I get into a job, a career in the future yeah. that ticks lots of boxes, that, you know, is, is if it, it's your thing, if science is your thing, how is it about science, but also about doing something good in the world, uh, about changing the world for the good, uh, about helping a big population and community of people, Come along and find out. Meet the people who are already doing that and working in this space. Yeah, and it's fun. A great day out as well, you know, exactly. all of those things. So, yeah. you, know, you know, check out our events programme. Check out how you can get involved in our community. If, if what you want to do is actually support us financially, then there's lots of opportunities there too. So we, um, we have quite an interesting business model. Um, we do work very closely with a lot of big companies and they sponsor our events. So, um, you know, we, we, we tap into their CSR budgets, we give them opportunities to sponsor, but also to be volunteers. So we have a really tiny team of employed people, but we have an army of skilled, <laughs> experienced volunteers. So I'm, I'm not talking about people, you know, that I don't want you to go and whack Latin in the <laughs> street. <laughs> not, nothing like that. But I do need your skills. So I need people who can market, who can help develop strategy, who can, um, you know, maybe help us as, as events managers or, or, you know, even just to bounce ideas around yeah, uh, yeah. events development. Yeah. So there's lots of opportunities there. If you're an individual wanting to, to donate, uh, but actually, you know, you, not everyone's got ready cash to, to throw into a donation pot. Mm. And you're maybe being asked by lots of different people, and I get that. Um you can do really simple things like sign up to Amazon Smile. So every time you buy something on Amazon, it donates to CRDN, to Cambridge Rare Disease Network. You can you can sign up to something like Easy Fundraising. Every time you buy anything online through any of their shops, um, you know, people who you buy insurance off, your holidays off, they make a donation to CRDN. So that's that's almost, you know, giving without having to do anything at all. Yeah. Other than sign up. Yeah. So, you know, go to our website. There's a whole page there that gives you ideas about how you can fundraise, how you can get involved, um, you know, no matter how big or small that might be. Mm, Brilliant. So there's loads of ways that that everyone can get involved, support, and it doesn't have to cost you money. 
at exactly. all. I mean, obviously, yeah. if you do want to do a big donation, well, fantastic. That will be put to very good use to help, you know, these kids and families. But but even just from everyday stuff, that Amazon Smile, it was the first time I'd even heard yeah. about it. So, you know, and we, 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 I think, are pretty well educated. So I think a lot of people listening will probably go, oh, right, okay. And, you know, and when new. you say Amazon Smile, they often think it's a different thing. It's yeah. not. It's, just, it, it's Amazon. Yeah. It's Amazon, but it's their charitable arm of it mm. so you use the same login details it just takes you straight to amazon smile perfect yeah, yeah so so that's just that's just going to take a couple of minutes of of your time to actually do that but actually you can make a big impact again so yeah. that's really cool so i love that so um we're going to come to the uh, final few questions if i may joe yeah. that's all right um so you know when you look back over your career your life and, and you've had a fabulous um a fabulous you know career but more than that you've helped hundreds, thousands of families and kids throughout your journey. Um, and it hasn't always been easy because it's no. got challenges, of course. Can you think of sort of a really good piece of advice that maybe you've received along the way or, you know, something something that's really helped you continue that kind of career and that philanthropic and the helping, and you know, that natural skill and desire and passion that you have for for supporting others is there a piece of advice that's kind of been pretty pretty regular or stayed with you throughout that journey do you know that this is this is not um this is not actually a bit of advice that's that's about about care or mm. the you know find it finding your passion and doing something you love that helps people but it's stuck with me this is this actually way more bland than that in a way but it's it's somebody who said to me you know work work from the minimum viable product mm. now that sounds really kind of like you know you're kind of thinking well what's that got to do with the kind of work that I do but actually that stuck with me through everything so you know when you, when you start out um working for something like a charity your resources are really limited mm. you know you haven't got much money you haven't got a big team you know everything that goes wrong you've got to deal with it and you've got to sort it out mm. and the problem feels insurmountable in rare diseases and you're thinking how can how can i as an individual do anything to even have a ripple yeah there to change stuff and I think going back to that minimum viable product, mm -hmm. just, to, just start with the basics. Don't feel like you have to do everything all at once. Mm. Don't feel like it has to be really fancy. You know, if you, if you haven't got a graphic designer to make everything look beautiful yet, it doesn't matter. Go and mm. get yourself a free Canva account. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's templates there. Just shove your logo in there. You know, we, we've still got the most basic logo in the world. Um... It doesn't matter, and I, I think I think that bit of advice actually for me um, was even more important because my my passion was already there. Mm. I didn't need anybody to give me any advice about that. Yeah, it it it's driven me since I was a child. Yeah, and um, and it will always drive me. But but that bit of advice really helped me. Mm. Just don't think you have to do everything, and that everything has to be amazing from the start. It'll grow. Yeah. Just start it. Your passion is what's important there and it's free. Mm. And and use that. Use that to inspire other people, to make people feel excited. Because actually, the more passionate you are, that free resource attracts everyone else with all those things that you need around you. Because yeah. it's infectious, isn't it? Oh, 100%. And, and that's exactly what's happened, how you've developed and continued to grow the charity. Spot on, you know, really. So I don't think anybody actually gave me that advice, but that's the advice that I would give to yeah. other people. No, that's great. I love that. Absolutely. And it applies to anything, doesn't it? It applies to business. It applies to life. It applies to relationships. You know, go on the first date. You don't know where we might be meeting a future <laughs> future husband and, and, or wife or whatever. And definitely, like, my, my dad was a real big... He, he was... He was behind my risk taking. Yeah. <laughs> so he, I wouldn't have said he was a massive risk, risk taker himself, but he was a real stickler for, he was a bit anti rules. Yeah. He was a real <laughs> was stickler a rebel. for if the rule doesn't seem that important, just break it. It's fine. And, and, and I'm not recommending you go out and break all the rules at all. <laughs> but, but be realistic. You know, yeah. be realistic. And, and he, he would really push me to take risks. The first time that I ever flew, <laughs> this is bonkers but I was 19 years old at university uh, not doing terribly well though actually I wasn't really academic and I didn't mm. like I didn't really like work 
I didn't like academic work that much. Just wanted to get to the end of it, really. And he 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 really pushed me to um, do a bit of a bonkers thesis when I was at university. So I decided to go to Australia to study Aboriginal healthcare. <laughs> All right. So I flew for the very first time on a courier flight. So it's something my dad had spotted in a newspaper. <laughs> you can't carry a parcel. <laughs> And you get a cheap flight for carrying the parcel. Brilliant. I mean, think about it. This was like 30 years ago. But, but now, I mean, it seems bonkers that yeah. I did that. I was a 19-year-old. I went to the airport. I collected my parcel, this little package. I've no idea what was in it to this day. <laughs> it smells a bit dodgy. <laughs> I did my courier flight via via um, Japan to Australia. And then that was it. I was dumped there for eight weeks um, to go and study Aboriginal healthcare. But my dad was the person that was behind me all the way going, yeah, do it, go on, do it. Brilliant. It may be mental, it may be crackers, but why not? Yeah, you've got one life, make it count, right? And, um, and I've, I've carried on in that vein ever since. Amazing. Just, you know, take the risk, just do it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I know I love this. And so the final question, is this podcast called Brave, Bold, Brilliant? And we've talked a lot about you being brave and making the impact and being bold and all of that kind of stuff throughout the course of this. But what wait, those three words um, or that that as a collective, what does it mean to you? Brave, bold, brilliant. I, I think it's about self belief. Actually, I think being it, it's not it's not necessarily being brave, is it? I've used that word a lot, but it's not. It's about believing in yourself. Yeah. It's about saying, Do you know what, I might not be ready for this quite. Um, but I know I can do it, and I'll get there. So I'm, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna try. And and I that brave, bold, but brilliant for me is definitely about believing in yourself. You know, having a word with yourself, as my, as my husband keeps saying. You know, have a good hard long look at yourself. <laughs> um, you know, and and just challenging yourself, having that self belief, having that kind of. That moment of reflection where you might doubt yourself, but then come out the other side of that and go, come on, you can do this. You're brilliant. See, that is the golden nugget words of advice. I love that. I love that. And we've been friends for 30 years. I know. Here's to the next 30. I know loads of really bad stuff about you. (laughs) Yeah, you're not interviewing me, but maybe <laughs> maybe we should do a reverse interview at some point in the future, if I'm brave enough, that is. <laughs> I mean, you know, but we're very, very different. And I think what's interesting about our friendship is that we are very different. But, you know, I, I've always admired you oh. as being the, you know, you are such a hard worker, you're so driven, and you have got such self-belief. But you doubt yourself sometimes oh, too. Nearly every day. <laughs> and you know, and, and you know, it, it's fine I, when I say you have that self belief. You know, it's not something that's there all mm. the time. It's not saying that we never doubt ourselves. No. But I think that's what we've got in common. Yeah. That we um, we both believe in ourselves, and we believe that we can make a difference. Yeah. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. That's why I've been friends for so long, so. isn't it? There we are. So Joe's going to tell you all the secrets <laughs> another time. <laughs> but honestly, no, it's been amazing. Thank you so much. And Thank um, you. Yeah, good, l- good luck with everything and charity. And let's just continue to do all these great things that you are making such an impact in the world. Well done, Joe. Thank <laughs> you. But, yeah, down to my team. <laughs> my, little, my little team around me. Always. Good stuff. Great. Thank you, Joe. Lovely to speak to everyone. Have a nice day.